Good morning. You're probably all jealous that I get to take my mask off. I apologize. Just seems like people can hear me and see my mouth a little better without it, so welcome to worship. We are in week three of being back in our space together, and we continue to want to need your feedback about how folks are feeling comfortable in the sanctuary. We know that each week is going to look a little bit different as we get different numbers from our province, and so continue to please give us your feedback on uh, being here in this space. In this space, we're gathered on traditional territory, and so we begin today also by acknowledging that we're gathered on traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral people. And we're giving thanks today for the stewardship of, their, uh, of the land throughout the ages from our native brothers and sisters, and we continue to do the hard work of truth and reconciliation and lift up that broken relationship that we seek to walk into a really new relationship together in. And we are looking at rivalry and reconciliation this week in our book, so it seems like a pretty good week to think about that. As we begin, just a couple of other announcements. I think, but we're not sure, there might still be some turkey supper tickets. We're, we're on the fence as to whether we have any left. So if you were hemming and hawing and have not got one yet, please make sure you give Karen a call in the office and let her know. I believe you could also contact Dave Boyd and he might know uh, numbers for, for those as well. And uh, Sergio wanted me to announce next Sunday, following worship at 11.30, so our services are running about uh, half an hour to 40 minutes right now, but at 11.30 next Sunday, folks are going to be invited to stay. We're going to do a brief celebration of Harold Hallett's life, and so uh, you're going to be invited to remain in worship if you're here and would like to be part of that celebration next Sunday following worship. I believe that's all of our announcements for today. I invite us into this space with our call to worship, and I'll invite you to follow along as you're comfortable and able. We gather this day for worship, seeking comfort, inspiration, community, and insight, to offer up our prayers, our burdens, and our thanksgivings. Let us worship in the light of Christ. And let us invite the light into this space as we worship. Thanks be to God for the let us pray. <clears throat> Loving God, thank you for gathering us here together as safely as we can in this space. We continue to seek your guidance as we muddle our way through together in this strange time of our human history. And on this day, we pray that you would continue to offer us hope and guidance we pray that in this time together that you would offer us connection to one another and a deeper connection to you. And we pray that you would offer us action to live out the word of God, the word of Jesus Christ and his example in our lives as we go from this place. We lift up these prayers to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Today's Minute for Mission is entitled, Sharing Circle Lives Indigenous Voices. Our gifts for mission and service support community ministries to work on healing hands for 
objects like the weekly shining circle at St. Mary's, St. Matthew's, Maryland. This community ministry offers health and wellness programs to meet community needs that are basic and help families thrive. One of the programs is the weekly sharing circle led by an indigenous community knowledge keeper, followed by a simple lunch. One participant describes the experience as this. The elder opened the sharing circle with a prayer and lit some sage, one of the traditional wellness methods used by the indigenous peoples. When sage is burned, the smoke cleanses a person's body, mind, and spirit so they can put aside their worries and be present. Also, it is believed that the smoke can carry a person's prayers to the Creator. Once the circle opened, we all took turns sharing anything we wanted. The elder taught us about the Anishinaabe creation story, and later we talked about what we learned. After the sharing circle, we had lunch. The lunch was, de the bannock was delicious. I was happy to chat with one of the indigenous participants who was a long way from home on the west coast of British Columbia. She first came to St. Matthew's, Maryland three weeks, three years ago, looking for uh, services, and the Worm, con Worm Congregation encouraged her to return the programming to the programming. Eventually, she started to volunteer and built her confidence as a helper. I was grateful to them for providing such a safe place for the participants to build relationships, learn about health issues, and support their goals for health and wellness. If mission and service giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you so much. If you have not given, please join me in making a difference by supporting mission and service giving and make it a regular part of your life. Giving can be living, loving our neighbor is at the heart of our mission and service. Thank you, Louise. And I invite you now to join me in our prayer before scripture. Let us pray. Holy One, help us to hear the words and the encouragement of the scriptures, that we may hold fast to the assurance of your love. Amen. Now I apologize that uh, it says the same scriptures as last week, but that's not true. I have a new scripture reading for you. We're not going to continue along with that Genesis and Galatians. Surprise, I'm going to read from the gospel this week. And so I'm actually reading from Luke 10, chapter 25 to 37, and this week we are looking at a familiar old parable. I offer you these words that say, Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, but wanting to justify this right answer, do this and you will live. But you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down to Jerusalem from Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. 
The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spent. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed mercy. So Jesus told the lawyer, Go and do likewise. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You who are our strength and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I got thinking about this passage this week as I was reading a story that's been circulating around for the last week or so, and I'm sure some of you have heard it. The new story is about a young man from Pickering named Joshua Telemach. And Joshua was the subject of a vicious joke, and I want to use the word joke in quotes because it was particularly poor planning on somebody's part that his high school yearbook tribute to his grandmother became replaced with a racial slur. Josh had submitted a yearbook message honoring his late grandmother who guided him through his four years of high school at St. Mary's Catholic Secondary School in Pickering. And that's just a couple of hours east of here, so it's a story for me that hits rather close to home. And when Josh got his copy of the yearbook last week, he was shocked to discover that the message that he had put about his grandmother had been replaced with a racist phrase referencing a gorilla shot at the Cincinnati Zoo. Well, one of Joshua's aunts took to Facebook to highlight that incident, and her post went viral, as they say, sparking an outcry of outrage from people, but also an outpouring of support for her nephew. And most of this came from strangers who had never met Joshua, but felt like he deserved so much better than the horrible way his classmates had treated him. Now you may recognize the name Pinball Clemens, and I want to explain how he's involved in this story. He's a former uh, Argonaut player turned GM for the Argonauts now, and he heard this story. Never having met Joshua, he decided to get in touch with the family and offer to fully fund Joshua's post-secondary education at whatever institute he decided to go to of his choice for the next four years. A good Samaritan who saw a wrong and wanted to make it right. I also remember a story, I've actually used this story before when I've talked about the Good Samaritan. And it's about a man named Wesley Autry who became a national hero. You may have heard his name in the news. Wesley Autry was standing on a subway platform with his two young daughters when he saw a man fall down onto the tracks jostled there by the large crowd of people gathered on the platform. The train was due in at any moment, but without hesitation, Wesley jumped down onto the tracks to try and get this man up off of it. And before he was able to get him to uh, the side of the platform, they noticed the train was coming in and there wasn't going to be enough time. And so rather than try and make it happen and get out of the way himself, Wesley laid down on top of the man. And the train came in. And the good news at the end of the story is when the train came to a halt, you could hear Wesley saying, we're okay down here. Please let my daughters know we're okay. What that man did was indeed a remarkable act of bravery, a remarkable deed of concern for another person. He didn't have any obvious reason to help this stranger who fell on the tracks. He didn't know the man. And he had his two young children with him to think about. And yet, without any, any hesitation, he saw something that needed to be righted, and he jumped in to save this man at the risk of his own life. Good Samaritan Saves Man on Subway Tracks was the headline for that particular story. Wesley Autry was indeed a Good Samaritan as I read this story again, and I believe Pinball Clemens could also be classified as a Good Samaritan. But I couldn't help but wonder as I thought about these stories, would I have done the same? Or have I done the same when I've read a story that's given me some pause and some outrage or if I've seen something happening, have I been as courageous or would I have been as courageous as Wesley Autry? Would I have jumped down onto those tracks with a train coming down to help somebody else? 
In other words, could I have been a good Samaritan if I'd been put in the same situation? Many people believe that these are exactly the type of questions that Jesus wants us to ponder. That's why they say he told this original parable of the Good Samaritan in the first place. The parable of the Good Samaritan is one of Jesus' most familiar stories. I'm sure you've heard it more than a few times. It's been uh, made into a movie subtly a few times. It weaves its way into literature. And we usually hear the parable in the, is the, the parable is as Jesus' way of getting us to ask ourselves, am I willing under the circumstances to be a good Samaritan to other people? If I see a person lying in a ditch somewhere or in trouble on the highway, on subway tracks, being persecuted by other people, would I risk myself to be of help to them? Am I a good Samaritan? But I'm not sure, and I wonder if that's actually what Jesus is really saying in this passage. If we take another look at it and back up to how Jesus came to tell that parable in the first place. He was headed towards Jerusalem, and in a village along the way, he got involved in this rather heated conversation with a local attorney. Do you remember that from the beginning? I didn't use the word lawyer very often, but the man who was asking Jesus all these questions was a lawyer. Now, we know that they are very good at asking questions. And so I'm sure Jesus had met his match, but the lawyer evidently didn't like Jesus' message, so he was pressuring him, trying to make him look foolish, attempting to expose a weakness in his teachings. If any of you are me, like me and like to watch Law and & Order and other shows about lawyers, you know, this is what they like to do, especially in the movies. I'm not so sure in real life. If anybody's a lawyer, just tell me how it actually is. But that's kind of what I have in my mind when I think about this. He is metaphorically cross-examining Jesus on the witness stand. In your view, the lawyer says, just what do I need to inherit eternal life? Well, here the lawyer says, Jesus, what does it say in the law? He turns it back around on him, and so the lawyer knew the law, of course. The law of Moses would have been his law that he followed, and he quoted it. The law says, love God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind, and also love your neighbor as you love yourself. Louise just read those words at the end of our Minute for Mission message. Loving our neighbor is at the heart of what we do. So what exactly does it mean? Well, says Jesus, there you have it. You're right. Love God fully and love your neighbor as yourself. Do this and you're going to have eternal life. But the lawyer doesn't want to let this drop so easily. There seems to be a trick in there somewhere to him. And so he says, ah, but just wait a second. There's a problem with your definition. State your terms, Jesus. What do you mean by neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Be precise. In response to that challenge, Jesus tells this parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, we know it's not the story about a man on subway tracks, of course, but it's kind of like it. Jesus' parable is about a man traveling down to Jericho who's mugged by robbers and left bleeding and near death beside the road. So... Like the man who fell onto those tracks, here is a man in serious, life-threatening trouble. A man in desperate need of help, and there's nothing unusual about this, really, because that road from Jerusalem to Jericho was actually notoriously dangerous. This happened quite often to people if uh, they were traveling alone, especially. Robbed and beaten, and sadly, it was a familiar story. It wasn't shocking, but two genuinely shocking things within the parable that Jesus tells actually happen. The first shock is that people who should have helped, in fact, who might have been expected to help, a priest and a Levite, people of God, religious leaders, came up the road, they saw a man in trouble, and what did they do? They went to the other side of the road. Why did the chicken cross the road seems to come to mind when I hear this part. They didn't go to this man. They didn't see somebody and help and go and help him. They intentionally avoided the man by crossing to the other side of the road and continuing along the way. Can you imagine if we heard a story about a minister and an OPP officer seeing somebody on the side of the road and going, ooh, I think that looks beyond me. I'm going to go to the other side of the road and not give them a hand. They simply shrugged their shoulders, turned, and walked the other way, is what this story seems to say. In our modern-day context, that would be a pretty big shock to read in the newspaper or see on a media feed, I would say. But if the first shock in the story is that the people who we expect to help out 
did nothing. The second even bigger shock is that the last person in the world we count on for help is the one who in fact is merciful and bravely rescues that man at the side of the road. Down the road, said Jesus, came a Samaritan. Now Jesus is of course Jewish, and the lawyer and the rest of those listening to this parable also likely would have been Jewish, and even the characters in the parable are Jewish, the priest and the Levites, almost surely the injured man, maybe even the robbers. But here comes a Samaritan. There's a difference here. A man of Samaria, the people uh, who are Jewish and Samaritans have a bitter history of religious and racial hatred against one another. They don't want to have anything to do with each other. Their enemies, in fact, not only would the injured man not expect any help from one of these despicable Samaritans, he probably wouldn't want any help from a Samaritan if he'd had the wherewithal to know what was going on. But here he was lying in distress, not able to object in any way. But it is the Samaritan, the despised and rejected one, who is nevertheless moved with compassion and who cares for that injured man, even though they were enemies. It did not matter for him. Having told that story, Jesus says to the lawyer, Now it's your turn to define the term neighbor. Who proved to be the neighbor in this story? The lawyer can hardly bring himself to even say the name the Samaritan. I'm sure I could see him mumbling it. The Samaritan was the man. He simply mumbles the one who showed mercy. Go and do likewise, says Jesus. Now, as I said before, some people think that what Jesus is saying in this story is, okay, everybody, I want you to go out and be just like that good Samaritan. He cared for someone in need. I want you to imitate him. Go and do likewise. But there are two problems with just thinking in this way. The first is that if it was really Jesus' point, then he probably would have told the story a bit differently. He would have made it more of a simple moral example and left out that whole troubling Samaritan business. And the second problem is even more significant. If Jesus' point is that he wants all of us to imitate the courageous compassion of that Samaritan, the sad fact is that most of us can't do it. That's why what Wesley Autry did on that subway platform is so remarkable and incredible. It's why what Pinball Clemens did is so remarkable and incredible. And countless stories that I've been reading over the last little while, especially in the pandemic, we want to hear good news stories. And uh, I loved one that I read about a woman who lived in a completely different state, hearing about somebody who was in need of a liver transplant and couldn't find a donor match, and so she went and had herself tested and donated a part of her own liver to save another life. Somebody she'd never met before but read a story, heard a person in need, and decided to go for it. Would any of us do the same? I'm not so sure I would. It's really a hard thing to think about. It's simply not in our human nature to forget about ourselves and risk everything for a stranger for the most part, but the question we should ask ourselves is why not? There was a study conducted a few years ago with seminary students. Now this one gets good. Seminary students studying to be ministers and the researchers gathered a group of these ministry students in a classroom and told them, you all have an assignment. Your assignment is to record a talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the trick was, the recordings were going to be done in a building on the other side of the campus, and because of a tight schedule, there was this need to hurry to get to that building. And known to the students on the path to the other building was an actor, a man sitting in an alley, coughing and suffering, and the students were going to have to pass by to get to the recording. So on their way to make a, make a presentation about the Good Samaritan, what will happen, these researchers wondered. Would they be Good Samaritans? The research showed that not a single one of those seminary students stopped. And in fact, one student even stepped over the man's body in order to get there on time to make their recording about the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's a good lesson learned. <laughs> but we shouldn't look down on the seminary students who wouldn't put the parable of that good Samaritan into practice, because in all honesty, would we? Would we remember the story? Because it's easy to come to this place and hear these stories. You've heard this one probably a few times, but do we actually put into practice the things that we hear and the lessons from Jesus that we learn? 
It's a tough question. It's a tough question because if we're going to be good Samaritans, it means more than a change of mind. It actually takes a change of heart because that's actually what I think this parable for us is all about, a change of heart. Has anything ever happened to you to help change your heart? Of course it has. It's happened to all of us because that's the point of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. When the lawyer, what the lawyer in the story discovered and what we discover too is that we cannot stand on the sidelines and figure out how to be good, defining the terms who's my neighbor and saying one person is and another isn't. That's not what helps us to inherit eternal life. What we need to remember is that everyone is our neighbor. Every single person is our neighbor. And in this story, perhaps we're not so much the good Samaritans, but the person lying helpless at the side of the road in need of the lesson from Jesus to remind us that one who was despised and rejected, because that is actually what happened in Jesus' life. We need that one to show us the way, to speak tenderly to us, to lift us up into his arms and take us to the place of healing. I think that might be the point of this Samaritan story this morning. And so the question for today is not the lawyers, what is the definition of neighbor? The question for us to reflect on this week is, who has been a neighbor to you? Well, we know that Jesus Christ has been a neighbor, so let us take his example. It's not an easy example to follow. I often say this, following the ways of Jesus Christ is one of the hardest things that we're actually called to do. But we can take that example, I think, and go and do likewise. For this parable of Jesus, for this lesson for today, we say thanks be to God and amen. I'm going to invite you to sit back and enjoy the ministry of music.
pray for God's people and God's world. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we gather here this day and we come just as we are asking for the things that we need from you. We come here today with gratitude in our hearts for all of our family and our friends. We give you thanks for communities that we are connected to and times of celebration within those communities for any special celebrations that are being lifted up, engagements, the birth of new babies or the announcement of a wedding happening, a special birthday, an anniversary. We give you thanks for the gift of everyday moments, particularly in this time that is challenging. Stolen moments of being able to sit across from one another and enjoy one another's company. We give you thanks for all of those essential workers who continue to be out there doing all kinds of amazing work and for those people around your world who are working as hard as they can to help us to return to some sense of normal. We lift up prayers for all who are connected to this community and beyond who are in need of your healing love. Lifting up prayers for our friends who are in hospital, who are going through treatment or waiting for a treatment. We lift up our prayers to all those who are grieving, to those who are feeling lost or alone, we lift up prayers for those whom this pandemic has made them feel disconnected from their community, from their job, or from one another. We lift up prayers for your world in need, for places like our brothers and sisters to the south where there's elections happening and much division. We pray for you to help us to continue to see that all of your people are our neighbor, that we are called to be people of love, to be the face of your son, Jesus Christ, to everyone that we meet. We pray for you to offer us strength when the days feel hard, to give us courage in the moments when we don't want to move forward and to offer us your love in those moments when we simply need to just be. We give you thanks for all of these gifts, and we lift up the prayers that we offer you this day, the ones out loud and the ones too deep for words, knowing that in your love they are answered. We give them over to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, and we say amen. spirit as you're able, and I'm going to offer a blessing and sending forth from this place, and just our usual reminder, we're going to start exiting with our back row going forward uh, from there as we enter, uh, exit through the back doors here today. And so, my friends, brothers, and sisters in Christ, whatever this day holds for you, may you go in joy and in hope, may you go in faith and in love, may you go to find your neighbor because they are all around you wherever you go. And wherever that neighbor meets you, may they see the face of Jesus Christ reflected in your face. Let us go now as our worship ends. May our service begin. Let us go in hope and in faith. Amen.